A few months ago, I was in the early stages of developing a new board game, and I brought it to a weekly meetup group to get some feedback. One of my friends, Abigail, has a knack for identifying problems that no one else notices, but that seem very obvious as soon as she mentions them. After we set up the game, she said, This looks like a lot of other games I've already seen. She was absolutely right. Despite all of the effort I'd spent making sure the gameplay was distinctive, there was nothing on the table that made it look distinctive, and that led to an underwhelming first impression. I had that exact same feeling recently on Kickstarter when I found the campaign page for a game called Planet Trade. The campaign generated a decent amount of support, but was still a long way from its goal when it eventually ended. For me, the entire story of why this campaign was unsuccessful can be told just by looking at this, the first panel of the story section. This preview looks like a lot of other science fiction games on the market. The color palette in general, and the logo in particular, are very similar to Race for the Galaxy. The main board shares a lot of the same features of terraforming Mars, like a single planet in the background, cubes keeping track of global parameters, a victory point tracker running around the perimeter. And the components are things we see in essentially every modern strategy game. A main board, sideboards, cubes, cards, tokens, and a few plastic miniatures. Above the preview, we see a description that says, Planet Trade is a challenging worker placement, economy, and strategy game filled with schemes and drama set in the far, far future. This certainly helps to narrow down what kind of game this is, but it doesn't do anything to set it apart from the many games that share these features. There's no hook. There's no unique selling point, nothing to stir the reader's imagination. Below the preview, we see a tagline that says, The game is easy to learn, but hard to master. Here's a quick trip down memory lane. One of the first board games I learned as a kid was Othello, an abstract strategy game whose rulebook is a mere six pages long. It features an elegant scoring system in which, quote, Players desiring to score their games may do so truly one of the games of all time. Othello was first released all the way back in 1971. And you want to know what the tagline was? A minute to learn, a lifetime to master. So for 50 years, publishers have been describing their games as being easy to learn but hard to master. You could probably argue that this tagline isn't even a selling point anymore. It's one of the defining characteristics of tabletop games as a hobby. And finally, let's talk about the name. To my ears, Planet Trade sounds a bit generic. But just to make sure I'm not the crazy one, I went ahead and did some research on Board Game Geek and found that there are already 185 games with Trade in the name and 286 games with Planet in the name. We can even go more specific than that and ask how many games have titles that are two words long of the form Planet blank. The answer? 33. We have Planet Unknown, Genius, Hysteria, Apocalypse, Explorer, Pioneer, Flipper, Raiders, Defenders, Busters, Masters, Voyagers, Hoarders, Rush Run, Box Bound, Quest Zoom, Steam Surprise, Exploits, Petri, Fulcrum, Infraserve, Etuk, ABZ, 28313, Court, and Zongo. And now, 34 with Planet Trade. So from top to bottom, this first panel is filled with missed opportunities for the game to stand out. The name, the logo, the description, the components, the tagline, they all give the impression that we've seen this game dozens of times before. I am willing to believe that the gameplay is distinctive. That's probably the reason why the designer brought this product to Kickstarter in the first place. But the average reader is never going to find out because there's nothing here that makes it look distinctive. At this point you might be wondering, does a game really need to be distinctive in order to be successful? Isn't it enough for a game to just be fun? Look at all the games that are clones of apples to apples, with more being released every year. Why does distinctiveness matter for some games, but not for others? Put that question in your mental crockpot for a few minutes, we're going to come back to it. For now, let's zoom in on the part of this panel that we haven't looked at yet. These figures tell us that the game takes 2-4 to four hours to play and supports 3-4 to four players. At first glance, this combination of numbers might not seem all that unusual, but the reality is that this is a major red flag. A minimum player count of 3 is normal for party games, 
but it is exceedingly rare for strategy games. This is a list of the top 100 strategy games on BoardGameGeek, as voted on by players. Guess how many games on this list require at least three players? The answer is two. Twilight Imperium and Puerto Rico. Why is that? Why is it so rare for a strategy game to require three players? One way to explain this is to look at the way people learn new board games. In meetup culture, the common etiquette is that if someone wants to bring a new game to the group, they're expected to learn it ahead of time and then teach it to everyone else. This is easiest to do when the minimum player count is one, so you can learn it solo, or two, so you can learn it with your ladybug. A minimum player count of three does not line up with this culture and forces players to deviate from their normal routines just to get the game on the table. But the two to four hour playtime is a massive commitment so long that it essentially requires someone at the table to be experienced with the game in order for it to run smoothly. Players do not want to spend four hours smashing their heads against a rulebook that none of them are familiar with. So between these two considerations, the long playtime and the restrictive player count, the net result is that this game feels almost impossible to get on the table. Even if I got it for free, I would probably never find time to play it. And if the reader can't imagine using a product that they got for free, how can they possibly justify buying that product? The exception to all this is if a game promises to deliver something totally unique. If it has a theme, a mechanism, or a component that I've never seen before, then I'd be willing to put in the extra effort required to get it on the table. Maybe I would learn it solo by pretending to be three different players at the same time. Or maybe I would organize a watch party where we all learn the game together from a tutorial video. But as we just saw earlier, there's nothing in this panel that makes Planet Trade look distinctive enough to warrant this kind of above and beyond behavior. So let's go back to the question that's been simmering in your mental crockpot. Why does distinctiveness matter for some games but not for others? The answer is that if a game looks generic, people will be willing to play it anyway as long as it's easy to get it on the table. And on the flip side, if a game is hard to get on the table, people will be willing to play it anyway if it offers a unique experience. A game must provide at least one of these two advantages in order to be a competitive product. And based on what we're being shown in this panel, Planet Trade isn't offering either of them. So what's the solution to all of this? Something in this panel has to change. If it's possible to tweak the game to make it work with one or two players, that will dramatically open up the size of the potential audience. And instead of giving us the impression that this is just another strategy game, help us understand what makes it distinctive. That's exactly what Jamie Stegmeier did on the campaign page for Scythe back in 2016. The opening section includes a list of the features that playtesters found most engaging, and a sample of the game's most distinctive artwork. The campaign was a massive success, going on to raise over a million dollars. To wrap things up here, I want to highlight that Planet Trade is planning to relaunch in August of 2023. I hope the relaunch is successful, because my hunch is that there is something special here, something worth playing. If you're interested in following along with the campaign, check out the link in the description below. I'm sure the creators would really appreciate it. In any case, thanks for watching guys, and I'll see you next time.